Watch this. Head on this Tuesday edition of the 208. We are in overtime for two major mayoral contests in Southwest Idaho. One week from today, voters in Eagle and Mountain Home will decide on who will be the mayor during a special runoff election. So how do the candidates separate themselves from their opponents? We'll dive into both races. Wildlife conservation groups are petitioning the United States Forest Service to stop people from aerial hunting or shooting wildlife from aircrafts in national forests across Idaho. We spoke to one group who has concerns about Idaho's wolves. It's humbling. It, it really is, you know, the, the generosity in this state. What a shopping whirlwind over the last week. My goodness, Black Friday, Small Business Saturday, Cyber Monday, they all lead to the most important of the cycle. That's Giving Tuesday. We're checking in on a special and new way to give this holiday season. Get the quarters out of the couch cushions. One week from today is Election Day Part 2. It's the same story in two Idaho cities. No candidate on election night got 50% of the vote in a split field. So the top two vote getters are going to go to a runoff. City of Eagle and the city of Mountain Home, they're getting a little extra election action this fall, this winter. And in sports, they would call this overtime. But one of the most popular comments we've seen from you at home on the Eagle election, what separates the remaining two candidates in terms of their policies and views? Incumbent Mayor Jason Pierce and his challenger, City Council President Brad Pike, are the final finalists in Eagle. So why not have them tell you in their own words? So part one of our Eagle Mayor off runner runoff series today, I sat down with Mayor Jason Pierce. Tomorrow we'll hear from Brad Pike. In the dynamic out of election night, it sits like this. Pierce earned 35.5% of the vote. Pike earned about 32%, and Stan Ridgway earned about 27%. So Pierce and Pike, they need to figure out how to appeal to the 27% that voted for neither of them. And that's where we pick up our conversation with Eagle Mayor Jason Pierce. Well, so for us, it's not just going after those votes, right? I mean, we obviously have to get our message out. I think that's the tough part has been is that, you know, there's been a lot of misinformation. And when you had three different people coming at me, as like I said, we did, you know, you've got everybody kind of spewing the information at being um, not always correct. And so it's just about getting out there. And it's not just the Ridgeway voters, but it's also the Pope Pike voters that might be changing their mind when they, oh, wait, I didn't realize that that's how it was. Oh, I believed this. I didn't, you know, and so we're getting that a lot. The Eagle Police contract is something that was uh, very much talked about in this room during mm -hmm. city council. Um, you know, here a few days away from the election, what do you want people to know about your thoughts on the, the contract going forward and kind of how that all went down? Yeah, well, you know, we're, we're always going to be fighting for what's best for the resident taxpayers of Eagle. And so we were in discussions with the sheriff's department about some things that we thought could be changed and done a little bit better. But you know, we've, since I've been mayor, we've raised the police contract 24% we've added to our budget for policing. We've added uh, four new officers. We've added a community officer. There's a lot of things we've been doing. And you know, our contract with the sheriff's department is incredible. I mean, that type of relationship and to have those folks being the Eagle Police, I think is a, a gigantic advantage for our residents in our city. How do you, I guess, balance investing into law enforcement and then also making sure you protect your budget? Yeah, I mean, I mean it's difficult, right? You've got to look at what's, what's best for the community, both financially and safety-wise. And of course, safety is always going to be the number one thing. And so if you look at what we've done over the last four years, we've always done what the Sheriff's Department has come to us with the budget and asked for. What do you think your biggest accomplishment has been as mayor over the last four years? Wow, um, we've done a lot of really good things. Um, believe it or not, even though the controversy with Avamore, Avamore is one of those things that I think has been a huge benefit to the community long term, right? For the next 50 or 60 years, we have set the densities today at what that's gonna be. And if you look at where people have moved from, if you've even looked at this area, densities don't get less over time. So for us to be able to set that in stone and 75% of the land that we annex to be left as open space for the public, I mean, that's gigantic. What's your assessment on the growth of Ego over the last four years and the speed of it? Well, so being here for the last 20 years and seeing a lot of the different growth over time, it comes in spurts. And for us, um, you know, I wish we could build the wall and we could say, hey, no more. We're not going to grow anymore. But unfortunately, private property rights are very important to folks in, in Idaho. And so what we've got to do is just make sure we stick to the comprehensive plan that we have put together for the city long term. And with that, you know, if you look at some of the projects that we approved, almost 
all of them have been at the lower numbers that are in the comprehensive plan for developers to be able to develop. You know, so usually there'll be a range like two to four units per acre. And we're having them come in at the two unit, not at the four unit, right? We're seeing um, projects that you know, might be able to go into STAR. And STAR usually has more density in their projects than we do. So we want it to come into Eagle because it's gonna be built in the same place. It's just who gets the tax dollars and then who you know, ultimately gets to decide how dense it is and how much open space. And once again, I'll go back to, I don't think anybody does it as well as Eagle in, in that kind of way. So coming up tomorrow here on the 208, we will hear from Mayor Pierce's opponent, City Council President Brad Pike, in a similar format to we just watched. And that was only a section of our conversation with Mayor Pierce. So this conversation and the one we'll have tomorrow, both will be aired in depth on Viewpoint. We'll compare and contrast and let you hear in depth both candidates talk in their own words. And thanks to both of them for their time this week during the busy election cycle. So the second race we need to check in on, who will be the next mayor of Mountain Home? That is also happening next Tuesday. Incumbent Mayor Rich Sykes received 42% of the vote on election night. Runner-up Misty Pierce received 36%, close margin. Here's what both candidates had to say about transparency in government and responsible decision-making in an interview today. We're very transparent. I wanted to be the most transparent mayor ever in the city of Mountain Home. I believe that uh, open door policy, I believe that you can call me at City Hall anytime. You can email me, I've answered all my emails. I, I do wanna make sure that I leave no question unanswered. I would like to make sure that we are um, responsible with our budget, with the taxpayer's money, while offering maximum transparency. When you get the budget, it does not explain that. It just says grant and the dollar amount. So I would like to bring that back to maybe dividing it and putting head notes or something in the budget of where we're getting that grant and how it is divided. In Mountain Home, one thing that will be different for the runoff election is there will only be one central polling location a week from today, next Tuesday on the election day. The polling location will be at the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Gymnasium that's located on 1150 North 8th Street. And a friendly reminder, early voting is open now through this coming Friday, December 1st. Coming up next on the News at 6, Hector Mendoza has both from both candidates. I should say more from both candidates. And remember to bring your voter ID proof of residency since only voters who live within the city limits can vote in this election. And if you're not registered to vote, you can register when you show up in person at the polling location in Idaho. Something I learned today, did you know in Idaho you can shoot wolves from the sky as part of hunting? Well, some people can. Idaho's Wolf Depredation Control Board has allowed the practice for a few years in the name of population control. And recently, the board approved three proposals for an out-of-state company to hunt Idaho wolves from their private helicopters. It's raised concerns from conservation groups who together completely oppose the practice. They say it's unnecessary, inhumane, and short-sighted. Andrew Bartline has the story. There's a whole line of work based in Idaho named for the wildlife the Wood River Wolf Project we'd previously evicted. Yeah. Suzanne Stone advocates in their defense. Probably around 1910, 1920, right around in that phase, uh, there were massive bounties on wolves back then. Leading to a complicated relationship today. In 1995, the feds restocked a protected wolf population and the management only turned over to the state in 2015. They would manage for a healthy population of wolves. But what we've seen is the rhetoric over the last five or 10 years has just gotten more stringent, um, more hostile toward wolves. Hostility, mainly from ranchers. Their agenda is to protect their livestock. The state tracks livestock attacks they attribute to the wolves. It's part of the Wolf Depredation Control Board's function and only half the equation. Most of the time, they've been very specific about targeting wolves that have actually come in conflict with, with livestock. And that's just been part of the Idaho wolf management system pretty much since the beginning. This contractor is, it's, it's basically open season. In October, Stone says the board approved applications for an out of state company to hunt wolves in specific parts of the state and to do it from a private helicopter. So he's been given this ability to go in and just kill every wolf that they find. To me, that's not management, that's eradicating a species. You're talking about Trevor Walsh? Yeah. Walsh operates Predator Control Corps, the out-of-state business approved in the application. 
Public records from 2018 show the state of Nevada reached a plea deal with Walsh for committing four trapping violations in five years. Things like leaving animals in traps, you know, much longer than what they were um, allowed to be, which causes a tremendous amount of you know, suffering for those animals. Um, and then there were issues with aerial, um, aerial hunting uh, violations as well. The Idaho State Department of Agriculture says these private wolf hunting contracts are for local ranchers, not hunters and not trappers. They further explain, quote, producers may then find appropriate contractors as necessary. The board is not involved in the producer contractor relationship. So we've seen people, um, you know, taking pups that don't even have their eyes open and they'll get thousands of dollars for killing those pups. And the government pays that out? Part of our taxes is going to pay for that. It was like Southern Idaho. And we've had 20 to 25,000, sometimes more sheep in our project area every year. We lose less than five a year to wolves because our methods are solid. We use livestock guardian dogs, we use lighting, we use sound. Um, we rotate around dens when we know where they are or rendezvous sites where they're raising their pups. Stone says killing doesn't have to be the first answer. They don't love wolves. They never will, and we won't ever ask that of them. But it could have her and other conservation allies calling on a last resort. Doesn't matter, but this is not how I think most people want to see our public lands being used and abused. Stone and other conservationists signed on to this petition are asking the Forest Service to immediately ban shooting wildlife from an aircraft. So that specific piece of it is where they have a bone to pick. Also, Mr. Walsh being connected to it as well seems to draw their concern. Now, this is a practice that is documented by the Wolf Degradation Control Board. It's not like there's anything hidden here, Joe. If yeah. you go on their website, you could up. It's it's not like they're hiding it. This report right now that I'm looking at, it's from summer of 21. It has a list, 12 cows killed, 27 calves killed. So they list it out to its entirety, and then they further say uh, deeper that during that quarter, 14 wolves were removed by helicopter. So it's something that the state is on top of, and it's not like it's a secret, uh, but it seems that the conservationists have uh, gotten to a point where they're upset with it, and they're asking it to change. If it doesn't change, they say they might pursue legal matters if... That's something they could get together. Okay, I have a feeling we will not hear the end of this one here today. So we'll continue to follow this Andrew Bartline reporting. Thank you so much. Busy times out there. The holiday season always a rush. So we're checking in across the gem state on what the word is. The 411 on the 208 is ahead. We want to hear from you. The 208 listens closely. Text us your comments, questions, story ideas, odd Idaho sightings, really anything. Here's our phone number, 208-321-5614. Please include your name and hashtag the 208 so we know it's for us. And some of these will appear live at the end of the show, so stay tuned and keep them coming. is going on around the great state of the 208. Well, today it is all about Idaho ski resorts. Here's Morgan Romero with the 411. 
Tamarack is getting bigger. The resort said it's moving forward with the Lake Cascade Marina after signing a 20-year lease with Idaho Parks and Rec, which manages access to Lake Cascade. The marina will have 200 boat slips, on-water fuel, rental and retail facility, a beach, and more. Construction of the public marina at Tamarack can start after the Bureau of Reclamation is done with their environmental analysis, so possibly early next year. Brundage became the first ski resort in Idaho to be certified as a white bark pine friendly ski area by the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation, all because of their efforts to support the threatened tree species. The white bark pine grows in harsh, exposed, high elevation areas and helps stabilize soil runoff and provides nutrition to wildlife. You can find the trees at the top of Brundage Mountain. If we're talking about ski resorts, we have to mention the two Soldier Mountain Pray for Snow parties this weekend. The first party is Friday at the 208 Bar and Grill at 6 p.m. Then Saturday, head to Soldier Mountain at 5 p.m. Sacrifice a non-living item to the massive bonfires to encourage Mother Nature to get this season going. Plus, enjoy live music, games, prizes, and on Saturday, free food. Plus, both events are free. Just make sure to register for Saturday night's party on Soldier Mountain's Facebook page. Soldier Mountain is set to open December 8th if our prayers for snow work. Sticking with ski resorts, Silver Mountain in Kellogg was named fourth in the country in Forbes top 10 best ski resorts for the money in the US. Forbes calculated a list of factors to figure out what resort gives you the best bang for your buck, including price of lift tickets, accommodations, overall snow score, and number of runs. The top three resorts on the list are all in Utah. And that's the 411 on the 208. I'm Morgan Romero. It's Giving Tuesday. Remember when we told you about the giving vending machine at Jump? Well, it's open and ready for your donations. After the break, we're gonna show you this cool piece of technology and explain what it's all about and yes, how you can help organizations in our community. Tell us if you've donated to anything today. Curious what's going on on this Giving Tuesday or text us about anything, you know how the show goes. Our number, 208-321-5614. Please include your name so we can give you credit and hashtag the 208 so we know it's for us. And you might see your comment live at the end of the show.
Beautiful shots of our full beaver moon from earlier this week. Twilight has descended on the Treasure Valley right now. The sun officially set at 5:11, just about six minutes ago. So a little bit of light left out there, but not much. 36 degrees in the city of trees right now. We got up to 38 for our official high in the city of trees today. Caldwell, 40 degrees, one of the balmier spots across the region. Look at our mountain temperatures, though, flirting with 40 in McCall, Stanley and Haley. Stanley was at negative one this morning, a 40 degree temperature swing up in Stanley. That's pretty phenomenal for this time of year. And Stanley was warmer once again than Boise was today. That's because we have high pressure that's in control, keeping that temperature inversion very solidly in place. As we look ahead to your Wednesday, another frigid start tomorrow. Morning lows in the low 20s in the Boise area will hit the upper 30s for those high temperatures again tomorrow. Air stagnation advisories remain in place through noon Thursday. But after that, we start seeing a shift in our weather pattern coming in, courtesy of that, which is the first in a series of systems that will come in Thursday night into Friday. It's still a very complicated forecast. A lot of uncertainty still out there. Here's the top takeaways. Up to an inch of snow is possible overnight Thursday into Friday morning in the Treasure Valley. Yes, it likely will be our first measurable snowfall of the season. Temperatures, though, will warm over the weekend as these series come in. That will lead eventually to valley rain, so we won't have much snow left over by the time the weekend is over and done with. Not the case in the mountains. That is not a typo. Up to 30 inches of snow possibly more is possible above 6,000 feet. Places like McCall, which sits at 5,000 feet from Friday to Monday, could see a foot of snow or more. Great news for ski resorts, bad news for people trying to travel through the mountains, so bear that in mind over the weekend. Temperatures in Boise finally on Friday hit the 40s, and we warm through early next week. We will unveil what we're calling the Idaho Community Foundation Giving Station. Instead of having chips and cookies and, and candy bars in there. There are donation cards that from 24 different nonprofits across the Treasure Valley. And people can come up to the machine, they can buy one of those donation cards, and they're making a donation to that nonprofit. And today on Giving Tuesday, the Giving Station is officially open and operational at Jump. Let's take a look. This morning, Jump had a Giving Tuesday special event, which included the unveiling of the unique vending machine. The whole point is to make donating fun, easy, and accessible, which is exactly what the CEO of the Women's and Children's Alliance, B. Black, said that the vending machine accomplishes after she saw it firsthand today. Well, I have to say, it's... Uh, it's fun because it's new and different and a little bit surprising. I never thought it would come through a vending machine. <laughs> Everybody doing a little is frankly what sustains the work that we do. You can donate anywhere between 10 and $25 at the machine, and those are the kinds of donations that Black says accumulate together to allow nonprofits to survive and thrive. The Idaho Community Foundation said that this is also a great way for newcomers to see some of Idaho's great nonprofits. Plus, it's an opportunity for families to teach their kids about the importance of supporting our community in a fast and meaningful way. You can head down to Jump during their business hours to donate anytime. And there are a lot of great organizations that you can support today with the vending machine or not, including the Boys and Girls Club. They said just $20 gives one child a healthy snack every day after school, and you can donate at adaclubs.org slash give. Another community organization, Faces of Hope. They help survivors of abuse through counseling, case management, housing, and other valuable resources. Your donation helps make those resources free and available so that so many people can get the help they need. You can donate on their website right now. And we know that there are so many more amazing organizations we haven't mentioned, but think of causes that you are passionate about, and I'm sure that there's an Idaho organization that lines up with your passion. You can also head to the Idaho Community Foundation's website, and you can search through different Idaho organizations to donate to. And remember, a little does go a long way. So happy Giving Tuesday. We'll be right back after this.
All right, here we are the end of the half hour. Let's see what you had to say about our show. This person says anyone can donate to any child lunch account at schools too. Oh, thank you, Kim. That's a good point. Uh, always a good cause. This person says, question, can people who didn't vote in November election in Eagle vote in the runoff from Denise? So as long as you're an eligible voter and you live in Eagle and you're registered to vote, not voting in the general election back on November 7th, that doesn't disqualify you. So get out and vote. And I know that there are people that are curious about that. Uh, this person says, why not reduce the cost of wolf tags and let the hunters control the numbers? That thought from Larry. A few other ideas on this topic. This person says, hunting and killing of wolves is so wrong. They're a necessary necessary part of a healthy ecosystem. Aerial hunting is just disgusting. Please stop that from Charlie. And this person says aerial population control in Idaho is not the best interest of game animals and sportsmen. It has been noted that the helicopters have moved big game animals under the guise of predator control. That's from Scott says he's the region three director of the Idaho State Bow Hunters. Appreciate that. Um, we got one more here. This person saying, hey, they're hoping that we also hear from cattle ranchers. And I will tell you, we are continuing to follow the story. Today is not the end all be all. We want to hear from some ranchers and I know our team is working on it in the newsroom right now. So check in tomorrow. We'll see you then.